All right, thank you for having me. My name is uh, David Mason. I'm a PhD candidate in the UF Deer Lab, which is Dr. Marcus Lashley's lab, and we're in the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Department at UF. So I've been you know, lighting stuff on fire and digging around in animal scat for uh, a couple of years now. This work is just wrapping up um, in the process of finalizing analyses and, and writing stuff up. Um, but I'm going to tell you about the research that I'm doing. I think I have some exciting stuff to show you that I think is uh, important and useful. All right, so today we're focusing specifically on fire. Uh, the UF Deer Lab, that DEER stands for Disturbance Ecology and Ecological Restoration. So something we're working on a lot is trying to you know, encourage getting more fire on the ground. Uh, and we sort of have this dual approach. We're trying to study you know, why fire is important, how it works, and we're trying to inform you know, practice and develop theory and trying to integrate those things together. Now, people burn for a lot of reasons. You know, they may be trying to uh, beat back you know, hardwood encroachment. They may be trying to encourage certain composition in their understory. Uh, and despite those things, you know, sometimes sounding different, uh, we're often really just talking about a direct consequence of fire, which is you know, essentially something related to removing you know, plant biomass or some portion of above ground biomass or applying heat to plants. Uh, but these direct, what I'll call direct effect of fire, they don't tell the whole story, right? Before, during, after uh, a fire, there is you know, a whole ecosystem of things interacting, right? And when fire is changing those interactions between organisms, now we're talking about a, a direct, an indirect effect of fire. And that's another big topic in our lab. And we demonstrate why indirect effects are, are, are important and how they may be useful. So what are the indirect effects? Uh, are uh, an ecological effect within intermediary. Uh, and they're really important. You can think about you know, a very familiar example of, of the wool reintroduction at, at Yellowstone. A trophic cascade. You know, if you're looking at the direct effects of reintroducing wolves, you might say, "Oh, it looks like the you know the elk have changed their behavior uh, when you introduce wolves," and that's fair enough. That's that's interesting. But if you really want to get at the ecosystem consequences, uh, it's also about how you know changing that elk behavior change, which plants are eating, where they're eating them, which affected the vegeta vegetation structure, uh, which affects you know the river and the water quality, and so on and so forth. So fire also has indirect effects. Uh, fire generates a, a resource pulse that attracts animals. I'm going to talk about that as a, as a magnet effect. Uh, and when these animals are interacting with each other or interacting with other organisms that are already you know, at the fire, uh, these are indirect effects of fire. So previous work has demonstrated that fire has this magnet effect on herbivores, uh, which can have subsequent effects on the plant community. You know, after the fire, you get that resource pulse of palatable, nutritious vegetation. It attracts herbivores. Specifically, we can talk about deer. That's a concentrate selector. It's going to be selecting particular species, particular individuals, particular tissues on an individual. And that's going to, that's going to affect the recovering plant community. I worked on a project where we, we demonstrated how uh, post-fire herbivory by mostly white-tailed deer made understory plant assemblages more different from one another. So you know, if you're burning without deer, uh, you're going to get different plant communities than you would if you burned with deer. So uh, that's useful information from a, from an applied and from an ecological perspective. But we get a lot of questions about the variation in the response to fire. You know, people are generally interested in uh, their own specific context. Uh, some of that might be driven by things like uh, you know, site history or you know how the fire was applied, what the conditions were like, et cetera. Uh, but some of that complexity is likely also driven by indirect effects and how these are varied. So even if some of the uh, some of the broad responses to fire are maybe somewhat somewhat predictable, uh, you know some of the, the specific responses uh, you know can differ, and, and that might be driven by uh, indirect effects. And that's you know, that's why we study these indirect effects uh, in our lab. Now, we talked about herbivory, uh, but you know that's just <laughs> That's just one end of the animal, right? That's just uh, that's just one side of the equation. You know, what goes in must also uh, come out, uh, and that part of the equation is is uh, you know much less discussed. So, as a master's student, uh, I was starting out doing plant ecology in a in a biology department. And, uh, 
and I'm having a lot of trouble explaining. I was working in forest understories, and I'm, I'm having trouble explaining a lot of the variation I'm seeing in the communities with just you know environmental factors. Uh, at the same time, I'm starting to work on the project I just described as a master's student, uh, learning about the magnet effect. And when I'm out sampling uh, for my master's, I'm saying, man, all these plants are, are animal dispersed. Not all of them, a lot of them are, are animal dispersed. And I seem to be seeing them in very similar conditions and similar niches, at least you know, similar to my senses uh, and my tools of measurement. And I guess, you know, I shouldn't be surprised that I was finding a lot of animal dispersed plants, as it turns out. And uh, this is based on uh, my own summarization of a global database because I was having a, a heck of a time trying to get my hands on a, on a hard number like this. But about half of the plants that are, are vectored, which means they're dispersed by something other than themselves, uh, they're dispersed by animals or can be dispersed by animals. And that figure is likely uh, really underestimating things because a lot of species without obvious adaptations for dispersal by animals, something like a fruit to encourage ingestion or like you know endozoocory or something like barbs on a fruit to encourage getting stuck to uh, the outside of an animal or epizoocory. Plenty of plant species without those adaptations can be dispersed by animals. There's a steady trickle of papers come out where they are you know, germinating some random animal scat and it turns out there's these species that have no known dispersal mechanism or aren't supposed to be dispersed by animals. They are in fact germinating out of animal scat. I've even seen things like, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Desmodium or, or Hitchhikers, it has a lot of common names, but it's a sticky fruit. Uh, I've seen that sticky fruit with uh, wind dispersed seed stuff to it, something like you can imagine like a dandelion seed. Uh, so that, that fruit could then be you know, stuck to an animal and now you have a wind dispersed species potentially being dispersed by an animal. Uh, so all that is to say that uh, a lot of plants can be dispersed by animals. So there's a ton of plants being dispersed by animals uh, and fires attracting animals. Now, why do animals visit recent ferns? Well, you know, we already talked about the regenerating vegetation for uh, a lot of herbivores, right? For birds, we can think about uh, increased visibility of, of prey and seeds. You know, later with the uh, you know, when the vegetation returns, there may be more insects around, potentially, depending on how long you're talking about, what species you're talking about, there could be fruit available as well. Also, you know, not for nothing, and I don't want to infer inside the, the mind of an animal, but it certainly uh, appears that animals are, are pretty curious about changes in their environment. And I've seen them come and visit in the burn, you know, as soon as the fire passes through, they're coming in there, and, and they're probably looking for food as well, but I think there's some element of, uh, there could be some element of curiosity as well. So there's a lot of a, a lot of reasons for animals to visit uh, a recently burned area. So I have this framework that says, uh, you know, fire has this magnet effect, uh, and it can you know attract animals, which could increase seed dispersal. Uh, at the same time, you know, I have a knowledge that fire is removing uh, some portion of above ground biomass and and preparing the seed bed. So I come up with this hypothesis, um, and I was lucky enough to pursue and develop and I guess continue to pursue it uh, in my dissertation work. So to test this hypothesis, first I needed to demonstrate that fire was attracting seed dispersers. Um, the most logical decision here was to use birds because, you know, well, first birds are really important seed dispersers. They're not the only ones. Your herbivores, your carnivores are also dispersing seeds. But, you know, trying to find the scat from some of those larger vertebrate dispersers uh, it's going to be rare. It's going to be more difficult to attack. It's going to be hard to protect it from seed predators coming in and eating the seeds out of the scat or from secondary dispersers, something like a, uh, like a dung beetle coming and rolling it away. Uh, so I said little birds because I was able to develop this, this trap. Uh, and this trap allows me to provide a, a secondary resource or a specific resource inside of a recent burn. So you can think about this in orders of, of habitat selection where you, know, you have your, your geographical distribution, you have your home range, uh, and within that home range, you know, the recently burned area is like a, you know, a patch an animal may visit, uh, and then I'm providing a, you know, a specific resource within that patch to congregate the animal's activity. So this is what the trap looks like. It's a PVC frame uh, fixed with a stake. That frame supports a seed trap, was essentially a, a one millimeter mesh uh, platform. It's a, a meter square surface area allows me to collect uh, scat and seeds. Above that, I have a perch, and that perch has smaller crossbars to accommodate different bird species. And then to monitor animal activity opposite of the perch, I have a camera trap 
uh, you know, mounted and it's, it's, it's set to take video clips when it gets triggered. So this is what it looks like when it's all said and done. It's not the, not the most sophisticated looking thing, but it gets the job done. All right, I was doubly lucky because I also get to do this work at, at Tall Timbers. Um, come on. Now, Tall Timbers is, you know, it's historic. Um, it's, a, it's a dual research station and conservancy. They're simultaneously, they're managing the system, um, but they're also studying fire, plants, songbirds, game birds, a whole, a whole bunch of things. Uh, you know, a big part of that management approach is, is keeping it in a savanna-like system, so that's burning and mowing. And because it's kept like that, it's a very attractive place for a lot of bird species, uh, a lot of plants, and again, they are burning. So it was a great place uh, for this experiment. Now, I was aware from my aware of my previous experience that you know, plants can be pretty uh, patchily distributed, uh, and thus so can the seeds that they disperse. Uh, so I used a feature of Tall Timber's uh, management approach to try to control for that patchiness and to try to control for variation that might be just due to the landscape itself. So tall timbers burns early in the growing season usually, uh, usually in March, uh, extending a little bit past that as well, uh, mostly on a, on a little bit less than a two-year return interval. Uh, and they do it roughly in this checkerboard mosaic. In other words, you know, the unit in the foreground that's recently burned, that adjacent unit, uh, you know, in the background, that is one year rough. In the following year, that one year rough will be burned and the recent burn will most likely be allowed to grow up into one year rough. So I could select these paired units, which you know, are paired by landscape context to put my traps in, but you know, they're experiencing different times since burn. Furthermore, I'm running the experiment over two years. Uh, so that means that not only are they paired by context, but each seed trap is, is being exposed to uh, conditions in a recent burn and uh, conditions in one year rough. I'll just say also uh, that the, the average uh, size of these units is, is roughly eight hectares. They do vary quite a bit though. So another kind of challenge that I was running into is that I really didn't want to, uh, my goal was to not have any gaps in data collection. So these traps need to face uh, hurricane season, lightning strikes and, and fallen trees, which, uh, you know, they're a meter squared. Uh, there's 42 of them out there and a couple thousand acres. Uh, so 42 meters squares and a couple thousand acres, and surely uh, a tree did fall in one of my traps. So what I'm trying to get at is that I wanted to have multiple traps uh, per unit um, subsample. So I had three per unit, six per pair, and then there's seven, uh, seven of these pairs spread out about as far away as I could get them on the property from each other. Um, so there's a total of 42 traps. Uh, and they're also mostly in the uplands. So this is what the data collection looks like. Uh, saw a variety of different birds, getting up around 50, 60 so far. We get you know, migrants like a summer tanager, blue grosbeak. We got the clips so we can watch, you know, birds singing, calling. We get some residents like uh, Easter towhee, Eastern bluebird. We get some more frugivorous birds like a like a brown thrasher. We even get some more predatory birds like a like a shrike. Uh, we even get some more birds, uh, a little more aquatic birds, or associated with you know, inundated areas like a red-winged blackbird. So the cool part with the with a video clip is that we can watch the birds consume fruit or consume things. But even better than that, we can watch the data itself be produced. What do I mean? We can watch birds uh, defecate into the traps. We can watch it in the morning, boom. We can watch it in the afternoon, boom. And we can even watch it with night vision in the evening, boom. All right, so I would visit these seed traps uh, periodically to collect the seeds uh, and to check on the camera. So here I am uh, after a recent burn. If you've got eagle eyes, you may notice that I'm not actually collecting anything. I, I'm I'm trying to fly the drone at the same time, so I'm just sort of demonstrating the collection process, but this is what it would look like. I would bring that collection back to the lab. Uh, I would you know, separate seeds from not seeds, uh, and I would group like seeds together, identify them, count them. So now I have a, a site by species matrix uh, and a time series. This is a uh, community data, so rather than 
you know, the, the, the frogs in a pond, we're talking about the seeds in a seed trap. Now, I've showed you what the data collection looks like. There are complications with seed dispersal and uh, I guess built in, uh, potentially built in assumptions that need to be addressed. First and foremost, seeds don't always stay where they were first deposited. Something called uh, you know, secondary seed dispersal or, or seed removal. And you know, my seed collections, they might not accurately reflect uh, any differences between you know, one year rough and recent burns if animals are removing seeds from my traps uh, at differing rates. And indeed, I've seen ants in the traps walking seeds out of my trap. I've seen uh, cardinals you know, popping up and down off the perch, grabbing seeds, eating them. So I ran these trials where I added a, a known uh, quantity of seeds from three different species into the trap. And then when I'd come back to make my collections, I'd also be collecting these seeds that I placed in the trap uh, and getting a sense of how many of them were removed. Um, there's some difference uh, after the fire in the uh, seeds are removed more often from uh, burn traps, but this, this difference dissipates through time. I also had to measure fruit availability. Most seeds do not make it very far from the parent plant. Uh, so another built-in assumption in this measurement protocol could be that the fruit is evenly available in the burns and, and the one-year rough, and that is not the case. Uh, you know, fires are moving above ground biomass, so a lot of species aren't gonna produce fruit or it's, they may produce you know, less fruit later, uh, depending on the, on the species. In a, with a naturally occurring fire, the bird may be more heterogeneous or maybe more refugia. There may be uh, more fruit closer to, you know, burned areas. But, you know, in a system uh, where, they're, where they're doing prescribed burns and, you know, tall timbers, they, they do a lot of cool stuff with, you know, feathering edges and stuff, uh, you know, mimicking different things. Uh, just in general, if you're applying prescribed burns, uh, you know, you're doing that for a reason. Uh, you're trying to get fire to pass over. So they're going to be, you know, more homogenous uh, than they could be. And what I'm getting at there is that there's no there's no fruit in the fire plots. Uh, so I needed to sort of correct for that or, or understand what the effect of that fruit availability was. So I measured fruit availability of some uh, focal species. And when I say focal, I, I just mean that these are uh, plants that constituted a majority of the animal dispersed seed rain in my traps. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen species uh, abundance curves, for example, where uh, you know some some species are you know, quite common, most are quite rare. Same thing is happening in, in my seed traps. Like the, the bulk of the seed magnitude is coming from a couple heavy hitters. Um, and that's not to say there aren't a lot of species, there are, but the magnitude is coming from those few species. So I recorded, I ran these transects around the traps. I'm recording uh, you know, when, when I see one of these plants and if it's fruited. So when we look at seed arrival, the first thing we can see is that there's a ton of variation in the data. Uh, but the reason I show you this is, is to discuss the, the role of fruit availability in generating the seed rain. So the rightmost bar, we see the, the mean number of seeds arriving in one year rough traps. Uh, now once we adjust that based on the amount of fruit, produ fruit producing plants in the vicinity of the trap compared to what's in the one year burn, uh, we get the adjusted total to the left of that. Uh, so we can think about the difference between these values as, as, as the effect of fruit availability. What remains in that adjusted one-year rough total is the amount of seeds uh, beyond the difference that we would expect in fruit production. So you can think of that as seed rain resulting from having a perch in one-year rough. Uh, when you look at the seed arrival in the, in the burn, uh, there's very little fruit available in those plots, very little. And so what results from that is, is that's the effect of a perch in a recent burn, and it's mostly seeds coming from outside of the plot. Uh, so another way to look at this is that seed rain is remaining relatively constant in the one year rough in the recent burns, even though there's no fruit in the, in the recent burns, or much less fruit in the recent burns. And we know that you know, seeds don't uh, typically make it very far from their parent plant. We look at richness, getting roughly similar richness in the traps. And the data set uh, there's, a, there's a lot of one-off species we catch, you know, a lot of rare things we're catching um, that are uh, uh, tough to identify. Um, I would say, you know, being extremely conservative, that we've got at least 50, 60 species in the uh, data set for sure uh, so far. But this richness is evenly spread, 
evenly spread between the burn and the one year row. So we're getting roughly the same magnitude uh, and richness of species arriving at the seed trough. However, uh, we can see that the composition at the seed traps is different. Uh, so like I said before, we can think of the arriving seeds or the seed rain uh, at the seed trap as uh, sort of a community. And we can use multivariate techniques in ordination to uh, assess the differences in the community. So this ordination is essentially taking what is a, a complex data set uh, and squashing it into the, the two dimensions that explain the differences between the seed traps uh, the best. Uh, so each point is a, a seed trap and, and where the species are listed indicates how important that species was to the seed traps around it. So I have uh, plotted some of our focal species here as well as some of the other animal dispersed uh, species that are quite common uh, in the seed traps. And there's some interesting patterns. First we have a, an annual partridge pea up in the top left uh, which is you know, likely able to produce fruit uh, later on in the growing season um, even after a fire. Uh, then and along the y-axis, we have a very rough pattern where we have species that are you know, fruiting somewhat earlier than the others, uh, you know, more associated with the burn, species that are fruiting somewhat later, uh, more associated with the one-year row. All right, let's get to the bottom of what's driving this pattern. So earlier I spoke about the magnet effect uh, for the sake of simplicity in, the, in terms of just attracting birds, but what I'm really interested in is, is uh, seed dispersers. So I've grouped them in a, in a very simple framework as birds that uh, are able to disperse fruit uh, and ones that most likely do not. Uh, if we look at panel A, we'll see that mean trap detections for dispersers are, are higher in recent burns, uh, but the detections are, are the same uh, in the one year row. This could be driven by the, the hunting modes of uh, many of the species that are grouped in the other, other category. Uh, many of them are highly insectivorous, not all of them, but many of them are. Uh, and so they're going to be hunting live insects on the wing or gleaning, you know, from, from plant parts. Uh, whereas the, the, the dispersers are more generalist and, and they're more likely to be eating, uh, you know, cooked fruit uh, or cooked seeds, sorry, and, and, and insects off the round on a recent burn. So if you look over at panel B, uh, you'll see that the, you know, the, this is a time series that the patterns are. Know, roughly similar, they have a, a similar sort of shape to them. So where is this difference coming from uh, that we see over in panel A? Well, it's coming from the time immediately after the fire. So you know, that's a magnet effect. Uh, so here we're looking at evidence that fire is having a, a magnet effect on seed dispersing birds, uh, but things start to become you know, more similar uh, as early as you know, May um, or a month or so. Couple months after the fire. So I'd like to say it's possible that the greater detections uh, that I'm seeing is specifically related to increased perching behavior in the recent burns. You know, so the camera trap would reflect it's you know it's on the perch. So it would reflect that increased perching as an increased number of detections. Whereas you know some kind of visual survey or, or listening to bird calls or uh, you know putting cameras on the ground or uh, up in a canopy that might tell a different story um, because you know birds have I have different behaviors. In other words, it could be that the, the perch is specifically what is more valuable in a recent burn, uh, where in reality, you know, total bird activity is actually similar if you looked everywhere. So knowing that you know the camera traps, uh, you know, could could don't tell the whole story necessarily. Uh, we took advantage of an opportunity where we were teaching this. Uh, wildlife habitat management course that was hosted at Tall Timbers. And uh, we had, I think, six pairs of students out there. And we did these bird surveys uh, in the mornings for about two weeks, and we moved them into different spots. Uh, and they sat in the blind and they monitored a transect that's, that's roughly a football field in length. And they were you know, counting the number of times a bird passed uh, across the plane indicated by the transect. So the sampling ran during when the course was which is you know, later on in May, uh, which is when, you know, according to the camera trap detections, uh, you know, things are relatively uh, even between birds that disperse fruit and other birds. Uh, so after the magnet effect. And you know, this is a, a similar pattern to what the students observe with their, with their visual surveys. Uh, now, this is just a, uh, a reflection of the number of times birds were detected, right? 
but you know birds could spend more time in a recent burn or in the one year rough or vice versa um, and it might be popping in and out you know they have access to both these you know and, and both the recent burn and the one year rough are going to provide different habitat components so they're likely bouncing back and forth um, but they may be spending more time or even you know dispersing more seeds uh, in one of the pots versus the other and that that wouldn't be uh, that wouldn't be detected by the by but just doing this visual detection. We do have some data on how much time they're spending in the pots, which I'm, I'm working to uh, include. So the key insight from this uh, bird data regards the timing of the magnet effect. When fire occurs determines when a magnet effect occurs, uh, but plants have varying fruiting phenology. Uh, some plants are fruiting early in the growing season, like uh, some of the rubus species. Uh, others are fruiting you know, a little later on in the growing season, like bruce and pokeweed and elderberry, and a subset of those species, you know, most produce fruit later on in the growing season, a subset of those species are going to have fruit that persists throughout the winter and the, into the following year, uh, and, you know, the fruit are quite valuable to, to residents, uh, resident birds at those times. So, the consequence of the magnet effect on seed dispersal also depends on when the fire occurs. So when we look at seed rain over the growing season after the burn, uh, we can see that the recent burn is getting more seed dispersal you know, following the fire, roughly uh, yeah, through May. And these collection, what I say is these collection dates are uh, reflecting what was happening at the trap before collection. Uh, so it's not an in instantaneous measurement. It, it's recording what was happening in the weeks following up to that collection. Uh, so this is roughly concurrent with the results of the camera trap detections for dispersers. And if you reflect on what we we just saw, you may notice that uh, this spike in, in seed dispersal uh, in the recent burns is happening when uh, certain species are fruiting. And indeed, most of the seeds arriving here are, are blackberries. Uh, so, you know, we're getting different magnitudes of seed arrival fluctuating at different times between the one year up and the recent burns. And different fruit are available on the landscape at those times. For example, some of the, the later growing species uh, they're available you know, during the during when the when you get this big increase in one year rough. You know, different different later growing fruiting species are available during that time. Uh, so the difference in the traps uh, that we looked at with the composition, you know, this is being driven by this pattern. Um, you're getting different species that are fruiting at different times, arriving uh, in different magnitudes uh, between the recent burn and the one year rough. I'd like to say when we talk about the magnet effect, you know, the length of that effect uh, is going to depend on, you know, I guess how you how you were going to define it uh, as far as how dramatic of an effect you, you're going to require to classify it as a as a to classify the response of animals as a magnet effect. Um, I think here, you know, rather than the scale of a, you know, several weeks uh, or you know a month or so, uh, the magnet effect for for these birds at least appears to be, you know happening a little bit later. Um, and I don't know if that, that, that could be an artifact of uh, just the, the fruit that's available in the landscape. So we're not catching as much fruit immediately after the fire because there's not as much available um, or if it's just that there's a lack. All right, so I'm showing you that there's these changes or there's this effect of fire on animal dispersed seed rain. But does this seed dispersal matter? That's the question. So I ran some uh, germination trials, taking seeds out of the traps that were um, that had presumably passed through the gut of an animal, which is an important cue for germination, among other cues. Uh, and we put them on the ground, and you know, pretty much nothing germinated. Uh, so you know that may indicate that seed dispersal or establishment you know, is rare. Um, it may indicate that there's other components of establishment that need to happen. So I also took a look at this uh, on a broader scale, and when I broader time scale. Uh, and I did find some effects of fire on the species that we were catching in our seed traps. So here we're going to start off looking at a uh, the standard return interval tall timbers, uh, which again is you know, a little bit less than two years. And then we are moving to look over at one of the Stoddard plots, uh, an unburned Stoddard plot. So this is a long running fire exclusion experiment with half acre plots burned in different return intervals, uh, going back to the 1960, I think. Uh, so I was surveying plant communities in the two-year return intervals 
and then in the unburned plots or, or some of the 75 year plots which have not reached that interval yet. So looking at the plant communities in areas subjected to burns and that don't get burned, well, we're much more likely to detect our focal species uh, in areas of burn. So being dispersed toward a burn could be beneficial because of the fact that you know fire occurred in this system, it likely indicates that fire is more probable to occur again. The reverse of that logic is, you know, uh, being dispersed towards an unburned area, uh, you know, that may be maybe sort of a lost cause for some of these species if, if misification kicks in, you know, and fire is excluded. Um, importantly, I don't know what the rate of success here is per seed. Uh, again, a lot of plants in a fire adapted system, uh, at least in these systems, are they're you know they're 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 resprouting, uh, they're regenerating from below ground biomass. Um, but you know, not all plants are going to return after every fire. Uh, and those resprouting plants, they they must arrive at some time. So even if seeds are germinating or colonizing, even if they aren't germin germinating or colonizing right away, this could be an important process for you know, generating seed banks. Uh, you know, colonizing might be rare, but you know that kind of you know, one way to look at it is that it, it heightens the importance of getting to the right place uh, to to seed bank or to establish. You know, if a plant is producing fruit and most seeds don't establish, you know, arriving in a place where the seed has a higher probability of establishing, like a like a like a recently burned area or like a like a burned area, uh, that should factor into uh, fitness. All right, there's a number of outstanding challenges uh, for me related to uh, seed dispersal by animals and fire. You know, I, I measured a lot of landscape characteristics that may affect seed dispersal, which I, which I plan to include in final analyses. I hope that that will explain a lot of the variation that I'm seeing. Um, you know, this, this, this angle of you know, the likelihood of colonization or how often does it occur, that is very interesting too. You know, what, what is the effect of seed density? Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, on the other hand, I, I imagine that the, whatever the probability of colonization is, it's probably varying spatially, right? So areas where the fire burned hot enough, something like this picture we see here, uh, you know, there's still smoke in that background when I took this picture and those plants are already you know, shooting up uh, really fast, except for that area where, the, where it burned really hot. So that may be a particular area where germination is more likely for an arriving seed after the fire. Uh, in other words, you know, getting dispersed towards an area that burns, that's one thing. But then within an area like that, uh, getting dispersed towards a particular area where it burned extra hot, that may be more favorable for establishment. Another thing I'd like to, another angle I'd like to work on is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a specific context here, a specific, uh, you know, fire regime in and in a, in a, in, in mostly an old field system, uh, you know, to, increase the inferences related to this work, it would be interesting to try to run these traps in other systems, specifically in some native long leaf ground cover would be interesting. All right, as far as practical or potential practical management value of this work, let's think about the species that I was catching. I got blackberry, you know, pokeweed, uh, beauty berry, among others, but these can be valuable species for wildlife, and wildlife are, you know, dispersing the species that wildlife value. Uh, so if you're looking to cultivate a, a community that provides, you know, forage and and fruit that wildlife uh, use, and you can look at this system to sort of indicate the potential, you know, knobs that you can turn to direct this uh, natural seed dispersal process. You know, we have the plants, we have the dispersers, uh, we have the fire. And of these, fire is likely to be the, the knob that we can you know, turn the most. So and perhaps you might be able to use fire to you know, direct species towards uh, certain locations, or you may be able to use it to you know, direct certain species depending on the timing of fire. You know, vegetation is, uh, is an important part of natural resource management. And we're often managing plants you know, downstream after establishment, or we are you know, adding seeds, you know, something like a, like a this gentleman uh, laying a food plot, for example. Uh, but check out this scat here. You know, there's a ton of seeds in the scat. So, 
you know, if you get the animals to do it for you, it, it probably wouldn't be as uh, dramatic, uh, effective, or instantaneous. Um, but you know, it's likely cheaper. Uh, it likely mimics nature better. Um, it's, it's likely easier to sustain, and it's going to provide value for a variety of wildlife species, uh, including you know whatever you happen to be interested in attracting. There's also some work indicating that using a resource such as a, a perch to uh, concentrate seed dispersal could be valuable in some ways um, as far as trying to you know regenerate areas uh, that don't have plants you know trying to bring plants to a, to an area uh, or trying to uh, capture certain seeds you don't want in the system so for example here we have ardesia granada uh, coral berry or, or christmas berry it's got a lot of common names but uh, you know if you set up a perch with a seed trap you know you could uh, collect the seeds and and remove them if if an animal is dispersing them, which you know, depending on what invasive species we're talking about, you know, may or may not occur. Um, you know, the, the question with all these these methods is usually uh, a question of practicality. Um, you know, I, I, how many of the seed traps would you need to do something like that for sure? And I'm not sure. Um, you know, this is just a potential uh, management implications for work like this. It's not something I've done research on. From a broader perspective, you know, this this magnet effect is important. Uh, we're talking about seed dispersal as you know another potential indirect effect of fire that we can you know add to pyric herbivory uh, or you know fire herbivory interactions in our understanding of how plants and animals and fire uh, generate habitat components and, and vegetation cover. Importantly, these things are very likely scale dependent. You know, we have public and private sectors often burning at different scales uh, based on you know, the, the size of their land and their resources. Uh, and then we have our research, which is you know, often conducted at a smaller scale. We're not sure how those things scale up all the time, but we know that scale dependent relationships are you know, pervasive uh, in ecology. So you know, organisms have differing ability to use space uh, to move. And they require different, you know, uh, vegetation types within their home range, or different times since burn often in their home range. Uh, so they're likely going to have different optimal burn sizes, right? And as you change the size of a burn, uh, you know, past an optimal burn size or past a, a, a past the size that an animal can can use the whole burn, you're going to generate uh, spatial gradients uh, in interactions. So you can think about something like, you know, seed rain or herbivory potentially, uh, depending on the size of the burn. And the animals or plants you're talking about, it could be decreasing uh, with distance from the edge. So my research is indicating that we have this uh, potentially important uh, ecological process uh, of seed dispersal uh, generated by fire involving animals. And what I'm saying is it's very likely scale dependent. So you know we're burning at different scales. So it's important to consider scale um, and how it's going to impact our goals or or our topics of study. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming and listening to me describe my research. I have a, a lot of work to do uh, yet, but you can keep an eye out for it to be published pretty soon. If you'd like to keep up with what my myself and what the Deer Lab is, is doing, you can find us on social medias at the, at the handles below. Uh, I'd also be interested in communicating via email if anyone wants to continue the conversation. There are uh, a ton of people who have participated in this work or, or with, with our work at Tall Timbers in general. Uh, especially when it comes to helping burn or, or prepare for burns. So I like to thank those people. I'd like to thank uh, the volunteers and technicians that have helped me process this data. Uh, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you very much. We have a question to start off. Um, so you all have questions for David. Please type those in the GoToWebinar. And so the first question is from Chuck, and it is, does the ash from the fire change the soil pH? Huh. Uh, I, I guess it's probably referring to, uh, we're talking about that on the, on, for plants germinating. Um, I'm not sure of the effect on that. I know that, you know, fire changes a lot of different soil nutrients, uh, but a lot of those changes I, I think are, are, are temporary. 
I, I'm not quite sure how the effect of you know ash on uh, soil pH would affect you know germinating plants, for example. But that's a that's a good point and uh, you know something I, I I should probably take a look at. Thank you. Okay, so while we're waiting to see if there's going to be some other questions, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can make a few announcements. Okay. All right, so I would just like to tell you about a few upcoming events and whenever I send you the recording of today's webinar, I will also share with you the flyers for these events, if there is a flyer, as well as the information for how you can register for these. So first off, I'd like to invite you to come back on August the 9th for our next Ona Highlight with the current president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association, Wes Carlton. He's gonna be discussing the current issues and incentives of the association, and he will gladly answer any of your questions that you have. And he's asked me to go ahead and ask up front, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and email them to me, and I will get them to Mr. Carlton so that he can be very prepared to answer them on that day. Uh, we don't normally get to do this ahead of presentation, so that's something you might want to take advantage of. Coming up October the 11th through the 13th, we have the Alvin C. Warnick Beef Cattle Reproductive Management School. That's going to be held at Hilliard Brothers Ranch. This is a very intensive three-day function, and I'm not sure how many open spots they have, but this program tends to fill up pretty quickly. So if you're interested, down at the bottom of this flyer, you'll see the email and phone number for Lindsay Wiggins. You can reach out to her to see if there are any open spots or use that wonderful QR code to take a photo with your phone um, to access the registration online. Also coming up in October is the Cattle Management for Women's Seminar. It is a program that they are going to be holding here at the Research Center on October the 20th from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. Uh, this it does say Cattle Management for Women, but it is not exclusive. Anybody can attend that's interested in this program. There is a registration fee. This is another event that tends to fill up very quickly. So if you're interested, you will want to register soon on event right. If you're not already doing so, please consider following us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And I'll share this with you as well whenever I send you information for the next webinar. And if you're not on our mailing list, that is something that you might also want to do. Just send me an email at ona at ifis.ufl.edu and I will add you to our mailing list. And you will at least receive emails from me once a Friday, once a week on Friday, and telling about the latest happenings, publications, events coming up, and different things that is happening here at the center. So that is all that I have to share. And as of right now, David, I don't see any more questions, um, but right. we'll make sure and share your email as well with the recording and anybody comes up with any questions, they're definitely welcome to reach out to you. Great, thank you for having me. So yes, thank you very much for being a part of today's Ona Highlight, and thank you to everybody that joined us. Y'all have a great day.